Good morning, everyone. A happy Sunday to you. And what a blessing to see those faces and to have you choose to be here with us this Sunday morning. Those who are here, those watching and worshiping with us live stream. You know, lately I've been focusing on the love of God. And the love of God, His love is manifested in so, so many ways, just countless. And uh, as we begin our service of worship this morning, I would like for us all just to focus on that. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, good morning. We thank you that it is you who have made this day for us and that you uh, and your existence um, is just all around us. We can see testimony as to your being here and your having made what we see and uh, we're just uh, constantly amazed. But even more so, Lord God, we're amazed at your love. Your love is manifested in, in so many ways in our lives and sometimes we just live our lives day to day that we we take these things for granted, but it's good for us, especially on a day like this, our Sabbath day, for us to pause and together as the body of Christ, just to think about you and your great love and how you've shown that to us in so many ways. So may we certainly count our blessings, God. May we be thankful. May we be humbled. You know, Lord, uh, David had, had written in the Psalms that your love um, is higher than the heavens, and, and he wrote that with the thought in mind that it's, your love is so great, it's just beyond measure. And that really is true. For David also wrote that your love is unfailing, even during times where we might be um, fearful of certain things, uh, doubtful of certain things. Um, we can rest assured that your love never ends. So thank you for your unfailing love. And, Lord God, we read in your word that your love can never go away from us. Nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. That should give us great comfort, Lord God, no matter what situation we are going through. So thank you for your love. And, God, in, as we ponder your great love, we can't help but think of your grace as well, giving us much, much more than what we deserve. And so we worship you today as being the God of love, of being the God of grace, who has bestowed so much upon us. We truly are undeserving, yet we are thankful. So right now, God, in our humble gathering, we want to express our thanks to you. We want to express how we believe and trust and thank you for the great love that you have bestowed upon us. We give this to you right now as our sacrifice of praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, would you please stand? I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, 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 Blind. I could not see Chains of sin had shackled me But God in heaven heard my plea And Jesus, Jesus Yes, he did. Sing again now. Yes, Jesus, Jesus ran. Yes, he did. I will sing. my soul
was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I was single forever. Oh, 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 o
gonna climb a mountain. I am a child of love. I found a world of free. I am a child. All right, here we go now. I'm gonna climb. I'm gonna climb a mountain. I'm gonna shout about. I am a child. Let's be seated, everyone. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, what a blessing. Let's not take for granted how awesome it is to be able to worship the Lord and sing some awesome songs. Thank you, Tim, for those. Let's pray this morning, guys. Lord, I just um, thank you again for letting us be here, for letting us um, come and worship you and come with all of the things that we carry. Please help me to take every thought that I have captive. When I feel overwhelmed by my emotions, my ideas, or my concerns, please remind me that you are above all these things. You are in control, and you are with me. I don't want to drift away from you because I let my thoughts wander, so draw me close to you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to make every effort to add to our faith goodness, to our goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if we possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our love. Thank you for showing us what perfect love looks like. Please help me to love others like you do. Purify my heart and my intentions, and let everything I do in life stem from a desire to glorify you. Father God, this morning, uh, first of all, Lord, I want to thank you for my wife, and Lord, because she organizes these prayers, and we were talking about this this morning, Lord, that I asked her why she does her prayers like that, and she'll, so she can be real succinct and, you know, say what she wants to say. And, Lord, I'm more like fly by the hip, Lord. You know me about this. And, um, Lord, I want to, this morning I'm just um, thankful. I have a thankful heart. Uh, I, I remember someone telling me one time, Lord, uh, it was Uncle Gene Garcia. He said, Travis, when, when I am struggling to love someone, I ask the Lord, Lord, teach me to love teach me to love. And so I'm thinking about that this morning, Lord, teach me to love when it's hard to do so. Father, teach me to love when I don't like my family members all that much. I always love them, Lord, but sometimes I just don't like them very much. Father, Lord, you have done that for me. And I thank you for the, um, I would say, more mature generation who bestows these wisdom, words of wisdom on, it, on me. Um, Lord, I ask for a special blessing on Betty Jo and ask that you forgive her for talking trash about me at the softball game a couple weeks ago when I wasn't there. Lord, I thank you for her. <laughs> I thank you for this church family. And um, Lord, sometimes as church family, we don't like each other very much, do we, Father? But we love each other. And, and no matter what happens in this church family, Father, I pray that we would always look to you to help us resolve these conflicts. Whatever conflict we have, whether it's um, good or bad or otherwise, or maybe it doesn't need to be solved right now. But, Lord, I, play, I pray that we all in this building would play the long game. And I think you all know what that means. But, Lord, you know what that means. The long game is to get to you, Father in heaven. That's the long game. Forget all this mess. Let's play the long game. Lord, teach us to love in this morning, in this building. Teach us all that. Teach us how to love real good. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures but my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love may would you stand with us everyone my chain my chains are gone I've been set has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing the shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be will be Take some time, everyone. Go and pray to our Lord. How has God shown grace to you? Thank Him for that.
Lord, thank you that you have um, shown us grace in so many ways, things that we don't deserve, but that's the kind of God you are, that you bestow upon us things that sustain us, help us, that guide us, that show us more of, of your great love. Help us to have eyes to see you at work in this way. And may we be quick to give you thanks because of who you are. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Yes, it does. Unending. Oh, so amazing. Amazing grace. You may be seated, everyone. Well, it is a joy to have you here this Sunday morning, and I'd like to talk about the, the ministry opportunities that are going on here at Lakeside. Let me first mention a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Terry. Thank you, Stacy. I know both of you helped to decorate our sanctuary and the, and the premises here on church, and you both do a great job. Thank you for taking the time to do that. And also, thank you to those who were out here yesterday for our church work day. Stephanie, you're noticing our rooster, aren't you? <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, we had to have our rooster in there with our, our picture. Uh, he was a staple for a while. And, uh, for a while. <laughs> and, so, uh, <laughs> and so thank you for those who uh, worked yesterday in our church work day. If you were here for the prelude, you got to see some slides of those who were serving. And so thank you for those who were working on both the inside and outside and lending whatever uh, hand you could give in, in helping to beautify and, and just help out our, our church. And so thank you for your time that you put in. And so let me make mention that, let's see, today's Sunday, tomorrow, Monday, our softball team gets back going. And so 6.30, uh, our softball team plays out on the um, field one, I believe, of the softball complex. Thank you for those who are playing and for those who are cheering, right, and giving, and, and right, some, right, we, uh, we have to draw the line there. And so uh, we do thank you for your participation and for your support. And let's see here, so we have on the 30, you know, we're almost finished with July here, friends. On the 31st, uh, we have the youth group that's going to be having a special meeting there where they're going to be serving at the Episcopal Church in helping to um, give food for those in need. And a great way to um, put feet to what you learn, and they had, been, um, they had a study just on showing compassion, and so a great way to uh, put that to use in, in serving God in a very practical way. So that is uh, the 31st, and um, let's see, Terry, I'm looking for the times here. It's like a 9-1, and so uh, go ahead and talk to uh, Joseph or Suey, uh, Joe, Amy, McMahon, any of those uh, individuals, talk with them about that if you don't know about that. And then the following day, Sunday, the 1st of August, uh, there is a baby shower. If you didn't know already that uh, Suey is expecting, and so uh, Joseph and Suey are having a baby shower, we're having a baby shower for them, and therefore that will be right after the church service. Uh, on that Sunday, the 1st of August. And I, I mentioned this before. You might be thinking, okay, Tim, so those kinds of things, showers, those are just for the ladies. And no, this is for all of the Lakeside family. And so we'll have uh, some things to eat, and then we'll go ahead and shower them with these gifts uh, in preparation for this uh, little one to come. So that's a week from today. And uh, let's go ahead and make mention of some uh, anniversaries and birthdays. So 
I noticed that they are not here today, but Aaron and Kim Johnson have an anniversary today. And then Bill and Janet Bradley have an anniversary coming up later this week. And then birthdays, John Hall has a birthday coming up this week. But today, today is Joseph Hernandez's birthday, everyone. And uh, Joseph, uh, I mean, goodness, we dearly love him and Suey so much. And, and Joseph in particular, that he uh, serves in so many ways here. <coughs> Pardon me, at, at Lakeside. And so uh, you, you've, you've seen him, uh, you know, instrumental. Uh, he works in the uh, AV back there like he's doing today, but it's so many ways. And so we're thankful for the both of them. But Joseph, happy birthday to you. We get to sing happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. We love you, Joseph. Happy birthday to you. All right. This is, uh, this is the funny thing now, because just as we uh, began the first downbeat of that happy birthday song, Joseph was thinking, oh, I'm in charge of the sound. I can just turn everybody off uh, here. <laughs> Thanks for not doing that, uh, Joseph. Well, the last few weeks we've been blessed in having uh, different speakers fill in for Stan while he and Jeannie were away helping Gregory to uh, move. Uh, back here to California, and so <clears throat> very thankful to Jim Black, thankful to Kevin DeLafu, but we're thankful that uh, Stan is back, so I'd like you to put your hands together. Let's welcome Stan back, everyone. Thank you, Tim, for that wonderful introduction. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back. And um, yeah, you know, I, um, I, I, you know, when you come back, you always feel like there, there's so much to say. Right, but um, I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. But focus on the on the main thing. I will say, I yeah, I do appreciate that Jim was here to preach for a couple times and uh, worthless Kevin. I mean uh, Kevin Delafu to preach as well. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate Kevin. And by the way, Kevin, if you are listening, um, it is true. I did shoot a hole in one last Friday, and I have four witnesses. So Kevin, just. Um, just uh, chew on that a little bit there, buddy. <laughs> anyway, I like to have fun up here. Um, and Kevin and Jim always do a great job, so it is so nice just to be able to leave the pulpit, obviously in God's hands, but men who love to preach, and they do the best they can, so very, very grateful for that. I apologize to you, Lakeside Community Church, for getting rid of the rooster. I know that was a big bummer for you. <laughs> but uh, could not come home having that rooster still around. So I hope you guys understand, rooster is gone. Anyway, it is, uh, it is good to be back, like I said. And it's kind of funny because in some ways you kind of feel a little rusty, like you haven't been on the pulpit for a while. And uh, so if the message doesn't come out the way you think it should have, that's my excuse. I'm a little rusty. But I did notice I typically like to have a bigger font for my message, and I forgot to expand it so it's small. So I'm ready to give myself an excuse if I have to really like look and see what I have on the screen. But anyway, so we're getting back into Ephesians. And uh, powerful stuff. What we're looking at this morning, actually what we're going to do, we'll, we'll kind of take a good look at verses 1 through 10 of, of chapter 2 of Ephesians, but then we're going to go back and dissect them more in the next coming weeks. So um, let's, let's look uh, at Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10. Actually, let's do this. So in chapter 1, we focused on a lot of stuff. Let me kind of remind you because it kind of helps us as we get into chapter 2. In chapter 1, we learned many spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. One of them is that he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. And he adopted us as his children through Jesus simply for his pleasure. And he redeemed us through the blood of Christ, lavished us, 
with all wisdom and understanding. He predestined everything to work out according to his purpose and his will in our lives. And he sealed us with the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our inheritance in Christ. And then Paul talks about giving thanks to the Ephesians' faith. He asked God to give them the spirit of wisdom so that they will know God better. And he also asked to open the eyes of their hearts that they may see the power of Christ in their lives and to understand what was given to Jesus will one day be given to them as well. This is kind of a reminder of where we went in chapter 1. Now let's take a look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. Indeed, Father, it, 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 it feels so good to be back in church with the Lakeside community. And we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, that every Sunday we have an opportunity to gather, to fellowship with one another, to, to sing songs of praise, to the, just experience the 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 moving of the holy spirit as we sing and ultimately lord god to hear your word and again lord we 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 just read through some stuff that's beyond comprehension that we cannot figure out on our own and so therefore we need you holy spirit to to confirm in us what we just read to encourage us lord for you know you know how evil the times are God, we need you. We need your help. We need your spirit. We need to be reminded of your great love for us, that you are in control, that you have never left us, you have never forsaken us, that you are here with us. Thank you, Jesus. Now bless us with your word. In your holy name, amen. So there's a couple, this married couple, who um, were, they were illiterate, couldn't read, but they were saved, and so they joined a church, and um, the husband joined this men's group, and this men's group had, they all wore red shirts, and they all had their own special writing on it uh, describing the pr- a project that they were doing. So this husband comes home and he's all disappointed. He says, all the men have red shirts with, with wonderful sayings. I don't have any. Well, the wife, undaunted by the fact that she couldn't read, decides that she's going to help her husband. And so she looks across the street and the first thing she sees, she sews 
on her husband's red shirt. <laughs> the husband goes back to Bible study and he comes back and he's so excited. He says, man, the guys in my group were so excited about what's written on my shirt. He said all the men really liked the inscription because it aptly described the wonderful change that they had seen in my life. It turned out that his wife had written under new management. <laughs> and this brother in Christ knew he was different and so did everyone around him. And that's what Jesus does. He makes a difference in all those who come to him. And there's a verse that speaks to this thought. It's not on your screen, but I'll read it. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? The truth is we are sinners and we are lost. We are separated from God by this wide chasm of sin and we need something done in our lives that we can never do ourselves. What we need is what Jesus alone can provide and Jesus makes all the difference in our broken lives. Well, this passage this morning is about the great difference Jesus makes in the hearts of and the lives of fallen human beings. And my hope is that God either sets you free this morning, or he reminds you of the freedom that you have from sin. So let's spend some time looking at what a difference Jesus makes. The first thing we see, and this is your, on your outline, is the first thing we see in verses 1 through 3 is the pitiful nature of man's sin. The pitiful nature and, and, and lost people, lost people live wretched lives. That's what verse 1 basically is saying. Verse 1 again says, as for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sin." See, meaning they are, they, they, are, they are dead, they are separated from God by this sea of sin. If you, if you go to the ocean, like Pismo or whatever, and you look out in the ocean, and, and you just see as far as you can the Pacific Ocean. It kind of gives you a visual of how separated we are from God because of sin. Isaiah 59.2 says, but your iniquities, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And so they are dead to God and to everything he represents. Now that verse instinctively tells me is that is that your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So often you get people like, for instance, I was on Facebook, and I don't spend a lot of time on there, but I saw that we're going to have a, 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 a high school reunion, and someone said, hey, hey, think of so-and-so in our class who has been put on hospice. Let's pray for him. That's great. But if those people who say that don't know Jesus, God doesn't hear that prayer, according to that verse. Does that make sense? Your iniquities have hidden God's face from you that he cannot hear you when you pray. You know, we don't like to hear that, but it's true. If you don't know who Jesus is, God doesn't hear you. See, spiritual death is like physical death. Only Jesus can bring one back to life. Think of those who, that Jesus brought back to life 
under his own power. Uh, uh, Jarius' daughter or Jarius' daughter in Luke 8 had been dead for a few moments when Jesus arrived. And then the widow of Nain's son in Luke 7 had been dead for a few hours. And then there's Lazarus in and, and, and John 11. He had been dead a few days. And each of these deaths are different by either minutes, hours, or days. They are different, yet they are yet still dead. All sinners are different, and yet all still spiritually dead. Only Jesus can bring to life. Now, I know those stories are meant to show us the miracle and power of Jesus bringing someone to life, which is awesome, but it's also letting us know that spiritual death is like physical death. You cannot bring yourself to life. Only Jesus can do that. That's part of the reason why those stories are in there. So we look then at, 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 at lost people or live wretched lives. They also lost people live wayward lives. It says that basically in verses 2 through 3. Let me read that again. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now working those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. See, according to these verses, a lost person is not in control of his life. And we all have this great desire to control our own destiny, don't we? You're going to do this tomorrow, just like I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm going to say, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go do this, thinking like I'm in control of my destiny of the week. Don't we do that? It's part of our nature. What we fail to realize is that we are just little pawns, controlled, controlled by our flesh, controlled by the world, and controlled by the devil. Think about that. When you live out this week, think about how much you're actually pulled by the world or your flesh. In John 8, Jesus says, you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and a father of lies. Now, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, okay, but he's talking to all those who do not know him as well. Every person is a lost, wretched, wayward sinner at some point in time. And that's what Isaiah 5 says, or 53, 6 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And wayward, waywardness leads to only one thing, according to Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that appears right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So we see that. Wretched, wayward lives. And also, lost people live under the wrath of God. Like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath. And every person outside of a loving relationship with Jesus is under God's wrath. But God's a God of love. Yes, he is, but he's also a God of wrath because he's so holy, holy, perfect. In John 3, 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on 
them. And the only thing that keeps a person from dropping off into hell at this very moment is the grace and mercy of Almighty God. See, at this very moment, it's like every person who isn't saved in Christ, they're like on this ledge of a cliff. And the reason they haven't fallen is because of God's grace. And God doesn't hate them. He doesn't hate them. He hates their sin. That's very important for us to remember. God doesn't hate them. He created them. He hates their sin. And His holiness demands that the the sentence of sin be carried out, and it will in His time and in His way. And we are at the mercy of God every day. You know, it's a terrible situation to be in under God's wrath. And yet we all have neighbors. And we all have friends, we all have family members in this situation as we speak. Some of you right now may be in this situation, lost without Jesus and headed to hell, and it's a reality that we have to always bring before us because it's that serious. You can't just take for granted or assume that everyone in here knows who Jesus is. I was in that situation. At one time, lost, living for the devil, headed to hell. Only by God's mercy and grace did he stop me on that path. And that is why I am grateful for these next two words in verse 4, which King James Version says, which I really like, but God but God. Those two words stand between a sinner and hell this morning, but God. And but God may be the greatest two words in the entire Bible. Not only do these verses speak of the miserable nature of man's sin, but they also point out, this is our second major piece, the awesome provisions of our Savior. And we see that in verses 4 through 6, but in verse 4, we see that He gave us love. Verse 4, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, and God's love, God loves the sinner with an everlasting love undying, never-ceasing love. In Romans 8, 38, 39, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from God, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you think about that, that means we absolutely, as God's people, have nothing to fear. And you know what? Fear tries to mess with me every day. Right? (laughs) Fear tries to get me off track every day, and I have to be reminded, I do not have to fear anything based on that scripture. And it was his great love of the Father that propelled him to send his Son to die for our sins. Sometimes we forget that God is a personal God. Imagine you giving up your child for someone else. That's what he did. He gave up his child for for humanity. And it was this love that bound Jesus to that cross, and thank God for the awesome love that he has for sinners. Again, he loves them, but he hates their sin. Years ago, there was a um, 
drunken man in Chicago headed towards Lake Michigan to drown himself. And he stumbled past the, the Pacific Garden Mission. And someone helped him through the door. And he collapsed in front of the preacher and he fell asleep. The superintendent cared for him, gave him a bed, and explained the gospel him, to him the next morning. And that day, Harry Monroe was transformed by the grace of God. Later, he was to, to preach the gospel from that same platform where once he had slept in a drunken stuber. And Mr. Monroe became superintendent of the mission. And when he died, it took all day for people to pay their respects. A newspaper editorial described him as one of the most useful men in Chicago. And Mr. Campbell then raised this penetrating question, what made the difference? What made the difference? How can a drunk who basically crawls to the pulpit falls asleep in front of their preacher, how does that man become one of the most famous men in Chicago because of what Jesus has done? Changed his life. See, the world would not have missed the penniless derelict if he had jumped into that lake, but God saw great value in him. See, the world may not care if you live or die. Actually, the world doesn't give a rip about you. But Jesus cares for you. He died to save you from sin, and he lives to make you free. Well, what else has he done, according to verse 5? He has given us life. Says he made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. See, when a person becomes saved through Jesus, they become alive, made alive in him. They do die to sin, they do die to Satan and self, but become spiritually alive. Think about Lazarus again. Think about the reality of Lazarus. When he was in that cold, dark tomb, he was oblivious to the commotion going on outside. He didn't hear those mourning over him. He didn't know that Jesus and the disciples were there. He knew nothing because he was dead. But just a word... Just a word from Jesus and everything changed. No longer was he dead, but he was alive and walking around looking for someone to set him free from his grave clothes. Can you imagine that? It's the same thing when someone becomes alive spiritually. Yeah, they may be physically alive, but they're dead. And a word from Jesus sets them free and brings them to life. When Jesus comes in, he gives a believer a new life in himself. And this is what being born is all about. There's another story about there was a, a, a man who, 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 whose name got put into the local newspaper obituary by mistake. And he was not a happy camper, as you can well imagine. And he went to the newspaper office and exclaimed, this is terrible. Your error will cause me much embarrassment and may hurt my business. How could you do such a thing? Well, the editor expressed regrets, but the man remained angry and unreasonable. Finally, the editor said in disgust, Cheer up, fellow. I'll put your name in the birth column tomorrow and give you a fresh start. And even though that may sound funny, which it is, in the spiritual realm, that is exactly what happens when we find new life in Christ. 
See, the, the life Jesus gives is no ordinary life. It's, it's an abundant life. It's a free life. It's an everlasting life. And even when I go through difficulties and struggle, 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 I'm still not bored. Because I know that God's going to use my current situation to make me stronger and, and become more free in this world. And according to verse 6, he has given us a lift. It says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus. And according to this verse, we've been seated in heaven with Christ. Now, I obviously have never been to heaven. But it sounds like part of me is already there, according to that verse. Because Jesus rose and went to heaven, we who are in him and he in us also rose with him. So when God then looks to Jesus, he sees his saints as well, even though we are still here. Half of us is already in heaven, and when Father looks at Jesus, he sees us sitting next to him. According to what that verse. Wow. Now again, these, so far these, these verses teach us about the pitiful nature of man's sin and the awesome provisions of our Savior. And third, we see the precious promises to the saints, God's people. See, in verse 7, we see that there is a new destination. It says, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. See, this verse reminds us that someday we will be in heaven. And when we get there, we will have an eternity to enjoy the fact that we will no longer struggle in these things. No death. No disease. No sorrow. No stress. No fear. No confusion. No depression. No addiction. No insecurity. No tears. Do you think that's where you want to be? Yes, because I'm tired of all that. And this verse also teaches us that it's going to take God in eternity to reveal to us all the things that we have in Jesus. That's how awesome God is. That's how powerful God is. It's going to take an eternity to learn about all the blessings we have in Christ. You know, we may have experienced a lot about God's grace today, no matter, depending on how long you've been a Christian, but in reality, we haven't even scratched the surface of understanding what the Lord has done for us. Well, then we see in verses 8 and 9 a new designation. It says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. See, many of these, we've heard that verse many times before. We've read it. And they're, uh, they're about the only, they're, they're talking about this is the only way of salvation, through faith and grace alone. And, and, and it's not religion, it's not good deeds, it's not, it's not church membership or baptism or clean living or family associations. All that will fail to produce salvation. It's only through the blood of Jesus via faith that you get to heaven. And no one's ever going to get to heaven and brag like, yeah, man, see how I got here? 
Yeah, I'm cool. It doesn't work that way. In heaven, every story ends the same. Sinners will point to Jesus and say, he's the reason why I'm here. Again, there was this you know, old man who lived in a broken down shack on a corner lot that was very valuable. And he had secured this property before the area was developed. And, and now it was the section of the city where millionaires built their homes. Well, one day while he was dozing off on his porch, he was awakened by a man who wanted to purchase his land. What's your price, he said. $100,000 came the reply. Fine, I'll buy it, said the stranger without hesitation. Before leaving, he handed the owner a check for $10,000 to bind the contract. In the weeks that followed, the old gentleman felt guilty about asking so much for his worthless shack. Thinking he could make it more presentable, he began fixing it up. On the day of the closing, the buyer came to complete the transaction, and after the final payment had been made, the old fellow turned to the rich man and said, Don't you think you've got a little nice place here? See, I painted it, I patched the roof, I put new boards on the floor. You sure can be proud of it. And the new owner responded, I can't use it. It must come down, for I'm going to build a brand new house. You see, God doesn't want you fixing up your old house. He wants you to tear it down and rebuild you in his image. He wants to start over. And Paul says that we have been saved through grace and this means we are now called something different. No longer called sinner, but now called saint. No longer children of the devil, but children of God. And not lost, but found. Not an enemy, but a friend. And when we come to Jesus, everything changes. Here's another story for you. I hope these stories are interesting. It's about an old, uh, an English earl who visited the Fiji Islands. Being an infidel, he critically remarked to an elderly chief, you're a great leader, but it's a pity that you've taken, been taken in by those foreign missionaries. They, they only want to get rich through you. No one believes the Bible anymore. People are tired of their, their threadbare story of Christ dying on the cross for the sins of mankind. They know better now. I'm sorry you've been so foolish as to accept their story. And the old chief's eyes flashed as he answered, You see that great rock over there? On it, we, we smashed the heads of our victims. Notice the furnace next to it? In that oven, we formally roasted the bodies of our enemies. If it hadn't been for those good missionaries and the love of Jesus that changed us from cannibals into Christians, you'd never leave this place alive. You better thank the Lord for the gospel, otherwise we'd already be feasting on you. If it weren't for the Bible, you'd now be our supper. <laughs> wow. See, this is the power of God in Jesus. He has the ability to take that which has been wrecked by sin and by the devil and turn it around for his glory. And he is in the life-altering business as we speak. Now, the last one is this. According to verse 10, there is a new direction. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, after Jesus, or after Jesus saves someone's soul, he changes their lives and he sets them on a new path. And he saves us to put us to work for his glory. 
Because this verse says that we are his workmanship. And this word literally means that we are his masterpiece. We are his crowning achievement of Almighty God. Think about that for a moment. God sees you more important than he sees anything in the universe that he has made. And my goodness, he has made some pretty amazing stuff, hasn't he? One of the places we just drove by on our vacation is the Grand Tetons. Beautiful. God created that. God's like, that's nothing. Look at you. You're most important to me. Masterpiece, crowning achievement. God determined that he will receive his greatest glory from taking old sinners from the gutter of life, save them by his grace, and then put him, put them to work for his glory. We are considered trophies of his grace, and he delights in showing us off. And it seems that nothing else brings him more pleasure as the life of one who has been saved by grace. If you think about an artist or a musician or writers, they do their best and they all have a common desire to bring their greatest work before others. The same is true of God. It's his desire to save wicked sinners and work his best through them. Lastly, let me just say, when a diamond is found in the ground, it's rough and ugly. But in the hands of a master diamond cutter, that rough, ugly stone is transformed into a thing of beauty and has tremendous value. That's the same thing the Lord does in our lives. He takes old sinners, old rough sinners, and he transforms them by his grace and his patient work in their lives, and he puts them on display where they bring glory and honor to his name. Isn't that what we want? Isn't, isn't that worth living for? Why is it that we forget what God's trying to do in our lives? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for powerful words i mean good grief lord amazing teaching from paul so deep and i do pray lord i i i you know i i think you want us to go back and even dig deeper and if that is the case continue to lead but thank you lord that you love us so much yes you hate sin but your love, your creation. And man, Lord, to be a child of yours, we only get one shot in this life. We want the best. The world doesn't care about us. The world says, follow me and I'll give you my best. And it's worthless. It's dead. But you, the one who created us, you want to give us the best. But it cost you your son. Oh Lord, help us. Let you transform us into the likeness of your son Jesus. Amen. From beginning to the end All my life is in your hands And this whole world may hold me down But it can never drown you out 
I'm not merely flesh and bone. I was made for something more. You are God, you're the great I am. Breath of life I breathe you in. Even in the fire, I'm alive in you. You are strong in my brokenness. Sovereign over every step. Even in the fire, I'm alive. I'm alive in you. Would you please stand with us, everyone? Through the dark I hear your voice Rising up I will rejoice That's right For I was lost but now I'm found Cause even death can't hold you down Amen You are God, you're the great I am Breath of life I breathe I'm alive, I'm alive in For it's no longer I who live, Christ who lives within me, yes, Christ who lives within me. From beginning to the end, you deserve the glory, you deserve the glory. Isn't that right? Let's sing that again now. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, Christ who lives within me. From beginning to the end, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory, you are God. You are God, you're the great I am. Breath of life I breathe you in. Even in the fire, I'm alive. You are strong in my brokenness, sovereign over every step. Even in the fire, I'm alive. of life I breathe you in, even in the fire, I'm alive in you. You are strong in my brokenness, sovereign over every step, even in the fire, I'm alive, I'm alive in you. just sung a song about being alive in Christ. Without him, we are dead. Would you put your hands together, please, and praise the Lord. We have much to be thankful for. Now, go ahead and please be seated as uh, just Stan shares a little bit with us. Thank you, Tim. So, um, you know, being on vacation, you have time to think and reflect a little bit. And um, as Todd and Jim and I have been thinking the past few months, actually the year, about sacredness of communion how you know we feel that we need to do a better job at preparing us for communion that way when communion comes you're like oh it's communion i hadn't even really prepared my heart so i'm just going to read a few things and then we'll 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 leave dear brothers and sisters in christ next sunday we hope to celebrate the holy sacrament of the lord's supper and we're called to prepare our hearts by rightly examining ourselves. For the Apostle Paul had written in 1 Corinthians 11, 27-28, Therefore, who, who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord 
in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man or a woman ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let us all then examine our lives and considering our own sin and the wrath of God on it, be sure that we humble ourselves in repentance before God. Let us examine our hearts and be sure that we trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation and that we believe our sins are forgiven wholly by grace for the sake of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Finally, let us examine our consciences to be sure that we resolve to live in faith and obedience before our neighbors. And God will surely receive at the table of His Son all who truly repent of their sins, believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and desire to do His will. All those, however, who do not repent, who do not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, and who have no desire to lead a godly life are warned, according to the command of God, to keep themselves from the Holy Sacrament, And if we are living in disobedience to Christ and in animosity with our neighbors, we must repent of our sin and reconcile ourselves to our neighbors before we come to the Lord's table. For if we partake of the sacrament in unbelief and willful disobedience, we eat and drink judgment to ourselves. This solemn warning is not designed, however, to discourage remorseful sinners from coming to the Holy Sacrament. We do not come to the supper as though we were righteous in ourselves, but rather to testify that we are sinners and that we look to Jesus for our salvation. Although we do have, we do not have perfect uh, faith and do not serve and love God with all our hearts, and though we do not love our neighbors as we ought, we are confident that the Savior accepts us at His table when we come in humble faith with the sorrow for our sins, and with the will to follow him as he commands. And lastly, and since it is necessary for us to come to the sacrament in good conscience, we urge any who lack this confidence to seek from their minister or any elder of this church such counsel as may be quiet, as may quiet their consciences and lead to the conversion of their lives. Thank you, everyone. It's been a beautiful Sunday morning of worship. God's word was honored this morning, and we've done the best to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper next week. Have a great day.